Thank you so much. Welcome everyone to National Organizations Respond to COVID Hunger. Uh, we know the coronavirus pandemic has significantly impacted our healthcare system, economy, schools, food systems, and all facets of life. In the process, it has created a significant hunger crisis in America. This panel will feature national organizations that uh, partner with the Alliance to End Hunger, discussing how their organizations have responded to COVID-19. Panelists will discuss how the pandemic has impacted their networks, how the organizations either changed or what they did to differently to support their networks, how they've worked collaboratively for an adequate federal legislative and administrative response to the pandemic and what lessons we can glean. Uh, our panelists are Chanya Johnson, lobbyist bred for the world. Hey, Chanya. Corey Malone Smala, policy specialist, Feeding America. Thanks, Corey. Jihad Williams, senior advisor, of government affairs, and government affairs advisor at Islamic Relief USA. Welcome, Jihad. Katie Jancy, director of government affairs. Meals on Wheels America, welcome Katie, and Monica Gonzalez, Director, Federal Government Relations at Share Our Strength. Welcome Monica, thank you all for joining us and for our partnership always. We really appreciate all of you. Um, so, so first I'd like to have the panelists um, introduce themselves and, and their organizations. Uh, so we'll, we'll go alphabetically uh, in organization order. Uh, so Chanya, why don't we start with you at Bread for the World? Very good. Thank you so much for having us. We um, certainly always look forward to partnering with great organizations who are doing the work. Um, and so um, I'm excited about being here today. I represent Bread for the World, a collective Christian voice advising Congress on policies around anti-hunger and anti-poverty issues. Thank you for having me. Tell us a little bit about bread. Okay, so bread, and, and I will say this, right now bread has gone through a, gr a great time. Um, I've only been at bread for eight months. Um, I started the week before the pandemic hit. And at the same time, we got a new CEO president, Reverend Eugene Cho. And so for me, it's all new um, in terms of the space of being at bread. But what I will say is this, that what I have seen is that we have re re recalibrated in a way that I, I had not been familiar with. I am a former Capitol Hill staff of over 15 years. And so we do things quite different. I'm excited about being on the nonprofit side, but what I have seen is the organization recalibrate to address the many needs of our network um, through a number of ways we reimagine how it is we're gonna be doing our outreach, but our mission remains the same as it relates to anti-hunger and anti-poverty. And so it's a full wraparound services of us having a new CEO with a new vision and mission for us to go forward and work together, but really looking at what we're doing in the field as it relates to outreach and making sure that we get the groundswell from you know, locally up to Congress. And so we have recalibrated and we continue to do great things at Bread. And so I'm super excited about being there. Thanks, Chanya. Corey, why don't you uh, introduce yourself and tell us a little about, about Feeding America. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here today. I am Corey Malone Small and I'm a policy specialist at Feeding America. I've been at the organization for about three years now. And before that, I was an Emerson Hunger Fellow. So special shout out to any current or past Emerson Fellows who are tuning in today. Um, through a network of 200 food banks and 60,000 meal programs, Feeding America provides meals to over 40 million people each year. Our government relations team also works to advocate for legislation that would increase food security for the people that we serve, supporting programs such as SNAP, TFAP, and child nutrition programs. So thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Thanks, Corey. Uh, Jihad, why don't you introduce yourself and Islamic Relief USA? Well, thank you, Minerva. We greatly appreciate um, having Islamic Relief here on this panel today. Again, I'm Jihad Saleh Williams, the Senior Advocacy and Government Affairs Advisor at Islamic Relief, based at our Washington, D.C. office. Uh, Islamic Relief is the nation's largest Muslim humanitarian and advocacy organization. Uh, been working in the United States for over 25 years. We do both international and domestic anti-poverty, anti-hunger work and advocacy. But for the purpose of this uh, gathering, I'll be speaking primarily from our perspective of our domestic work 
but we provide our thousands of uh, supporters who are donors, who are volunteers, and who are advocates, various ways to support humanitarian anti-poverty programs. And when it comes to actual direct implementation or providing services to clients and communities in need, we work with local partners around the country. Um, and, and I'm proud to say during just this COVID response for these past nearly 10 months, uh, we've worked with over 225 organizations and over 40 states and uh, territories, providing them grant support, advocacy support, and helping them increase their ability to respond to the needs of the communities that they serve. Thanks, Jihad. Uh, Katie, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us about Meals on Wheels America? Yeah, hi everyone. Um, thank you, Minerva, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Katie Jancy. I'm the Director of Government Affairs at Meals on Wheels America. Very happy to be here with you all today. Um, so Meals on Wheels America is a national organization that supports and represents the thousands of local senior nutrition programs across the country. These are the programs that provide nutrition, social connection to older adults. And I think the name Meals on Wheels is often very familiar to people, but to those who aren't exactly sure what these programs do, they're local programs in ev virtually, truly every community across the country that deliver meals directly to people's homes, primarily older adults or those experiencing disability who may be homebound due to mobility, other issues, who have difficulty accessing food and difficulty preparing their own meals. Um, and many Meals and Wheels programs also have congregate sites. Of course, these have had to change during COVID, but these are, are uh, places where older adults or individuals can join together in groups. Think about an adult day center or special cafes um, where um, people not only can get meals, but have time to um, have social connection with one another. So thank you again, glad to be here. Thank you, Katie. Monica, tell us a little bit more about yourself and share our strength. Great, thank you, Minerva. Um, one, I wanna thank you for having us here with you and for always the partnership um, with you and all of my esteemed colleagues on this panel. Um, Share a Strength is an organization focused on eliminating child hunger across the United States. Um, today, as a result of the pandemic, we know that one in four children are experiencing hunger and that we know that there are many families in particular um, Black and Latino families who are experiencing a high rate of hunger at this time. We know that many of them are struggling to put food on the table and um, to be able to um, make sure that their children have meals every day of the week. Um, but right now that's not possible. Um, many of them are experiencing a lot of hardship due to unemployment. At the same time, um, just to give you a little bit about myself, um, I'm the director of federal government relations and I oversee all of our federal strategies on behalf of Share Our Strength. So I'm excited to be here today and to talk about um, how we can continue to advance policies that will help people going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and now uh, I'd love all of the panelists to answer uh, this question and, and maybe we'll shake it up and go in reverse order and start with you, Monica. Um, but how has your network been affected by the pandemic and what has your organization done in response? You know, um, I think when it comes to feeding children, um, our network was really impacted significantly. When we think about what we call our hunger heroes, school nutrition staff, um, who had to turn on a dime to ensure that children who were relying on free and reduced price meals were able to get food during this pandemic. Um, hats off to them for being so nimble and for quickly having to adjust. Um, so I would say just like the rest of the country in big and small ways, it had a significant impact on really trying to figure out how they would safely and effectively meet the needs of children um, who really needed access to those meals. I will say though, despite how much, you know, the network has had to be nimble, it's also created opportunities for innovation and opportunities for us to rethink um, how we could best and most efficiently deliver meals to kids. And I think as we think about the summer meals program and some of the policy priorities we're trying to 
advance there around um, providing for non-congregate options, as well as the permanent authorization of summer EBT, it would be fair to say that we really road tested some of those programs now. And today with the um, implementation of pandemic EBT, as well as um, grab and go types of um, delivery methods for children. Thank you, Monica. Um, Katie, uh, would you answer that question? How has the pandemic impacted your network and what has Meals on Wheels America done uh, to uh, support them? Yeah, thank you. And I'm so glad to go after Monica. It's great to be able to talk about the spectrum of food security across the lifespan and the focus on children and so much of our uh, focus at Meals on Wheels America is on the older adult population. And I'm sure many of you are quite aware that um, older adults have been among, among other groups, among those who have been at risk of the harmful effects of COVID-19. And we saw, um, our country has seen older adults need to self-isolate and shelter at home for their safety and to remain home longer than some, as communities reopen. And so probably the most immediate impact of the pandemic for Meals and Meals programs was this just incredibly large increase in requests for services from older adults, some of whom before may have been able to be more independent to access nutritious food, but were no longer able to do so. Um, I wanted to share, we did a survey over the past few months, a few months ago with our members and um, trying to highlight some of how the need has increased um, prior, compared to pre-COVID, if we can remember back that far, but before March 1st, um, senior nutrition programs are serving an average of 77% more meals to almost 50% more older adults, which is just truly a, a an incredible number, especially for smaller Meals on Wheels programs. Um, that's just a big jump in service and in need in communities and, and costs have risen. I mean, we've all seen that, right? Cost of food and transportation, safety supplies all have increased. So all of this has, has really um, compounded for programs um, in terms of needing resources, um, not only from their communities, but in terms of federal resources to help support this, this need that, that um, is growing. Um, you know, programs have done, as Monica was saying, it's, you know, pro local programs have done some truly innovative changes in operations in order to keep service going, whether that's been no contact delivery, but still, you know, being able to deliver a meal without, while still maintaining safe distancing or, or changing these congregate sites to more of a grab and go site. I think that's a common theme we see across age groups as well. Um, and I just wanted to highlight too that it's also been important to find other ways to maintain social connection. So of course, delivery of a meal is important for nutrition, but it's also important to address social isolation, which is something we're all dealing with now. So we've really seen some of these uh, local programs find ways to stay connected, whether it's through telephone calls or technology when that's available. It's just really interesting ways to make sure we're staying together. And so, you know, at Meals on Wheels America, in order to support this, we, along with our colleagues on, on this panel, so glad to be with all of you, have all been advocating together for this large spectrum of policy and funding that's needed to support, um, to support our communities. And specifically with us, along with uh, the SNAP and um, other programs, we've been advocating for funding through the Older Americans Act and for nonprofit relief, um, and generally just truly continuing to push for COVID relief as, as it continues for all of us. So thank you, I'll stop there. Thanks, Katie. Jihad? Oh, thank you. I, I really agree with the, the points that Monica um, and uh, Karen made prior, uh, but I wanna take it from the perspective of actually the ability for our organizations just to operate in themselves, particularly for those of us who are actually implementing or grant making institutions to local based and regional organizations. Uh, and during this time of pandemic, uh, we have to acknowledge uh, some of our organizations and our peers are struggling to maintain, to keep their own doors open because of traditional donors or annual donors who are themselves maybe fi facing financial hardship or insecurity or are not quick to hand over the charitable donations, mm -hmm. even though the need is greater. So in that, uh, I just want to say, I thank Islamic League supporters in the sense that this year we've had a record breaking turnout and we're blessed in that way. And I only say that again, not out of, you know, the, 
say how great our donors are, but also we got to admit to recognize again, we know many of our network or organizations are downsizing. So that's a blessing. But with that increase in donations and people willing to give, to potentially sacrifice, give their own dollars to help make sure that other communities that are facing even greater hardship, that there are still programs available or response to their needs. Uh, Islamic Leaf has had to try to go bigger now with a bigger pot of funding than also now. That also means getting out those dollars to new organizations. And I mentioned earlier that we had the opportunity this year, just in the past 10 months, to, to fund uh, about 225 unique organizations in over 40 states. That's compared to in past years, where we operate working with about 40 to 60 consistent grant partners in about 15 to 20 states. So we've grown and we give praise due to God and to those supporters who allow us to do that work and respond and increase our connections and our relationships with organizations, particularly outside the Muslim American community, food banks and uh, Islamic centers and community organizations, but also now increasing our partners who are also other faith-based organizations, Christian and Jewish and other secular organizations. As, as we've seen now, so many organizations because they're, the demand is so great, they're looking for new sources of support uh, through grants. And then and we also recognize that ultimately, no matter what, in the hunger sector, in the nonprofit sector, that we are never going to be able to fulfill the overall need, particularly on hunger. And so there will always be more people with need. And so we've seen the recognition that many of our grant partners uh, recognize they're now serving three to 400% more people than they were just last year. And they're not gonna be able to fully respond and recognizing there needs to be a concerted government effort in responding to the need. And so we've seen now also a change in many of our organizations that we fund uh, and grant are, have been much more willing where I follow up after our grants program engages with them and saying, well, Islam provides a suite of advocacy uh, uh, tools and resources that we can help provide you and support you in your advocacy. And many of them are much more willing now to take time or their president or their CEO, because many of these organizations don't have a, a designated government affairs or advocacy part, uh, 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 staff member or a volunteer. They're taking much more uh, utilizing our resources. And we've gone from uh, a, a small number of grant partners who advocate with us now just this year. I think we've, we've covered over 15 states meetings with senators, both senators, you know, for each state, many of the uh, members of Congress, uh, where, where we may have partners, organizations, maybe three or four organizations in a given district. So increasing the advocacy capacity and desire to do advocacy on food security and anti-poverty issues during these, uh, during COVID to supplement also their direct response. Thank you, Jihan. Um, Corey, why don't you tell us how the Feeding America Network has been impacted and what you've all done? Thank you so much, Minerva. Um, many of you have probably seen photographs or footage of the long lines of cars waiting for food assistance at food banks. Um, we saw a lot of those images in March and we're seeing them again as uh, we head into a third wave of COVID and we inch closer to the winter. Um, COVID-19 has been a perfect storm triple whammy um, in terms of its effect on the Feeding America network. We've seen about 60% increased demand uh, for food assistance, uh, coupling that with decline in donations for food, um, disruptions to food banks, typical operating models, whether that be food sourcing um, or a volunteer base there's been a lot of challenges that have been faced um, as a result of COVID and that many of the panelists have already touched on this far. Um, food bankers and volunteers and these partner agencies have been on the front line of this pandemic, uh, ensuring neighbors have the food that they need to get through this difficult time, um, coming up with innovative ways to serve people safely um, during, this, during this crisis. Um, we also know that for every meal provided by the Feeding America Network, SNAP provides nine. Uh, food banks can't do this work alone. Um, it is so critical uh, to invest in federal nutrition programs during this time. It is the best defense against um, economic hardship. And at, because of this, our um, network of food banks have worked with lawmakers to educate them about this incre increased demand in food assistance and making it clear that investments in nutrition programs like SNAP is the best way to help families put food on the table during this time. Um, a lot of our work too, we've um, 
our research team has worked tirelessly to um, come up with um, estimates to show how dire of a situation this is. Um, I'm happy to share some of those resources in the chat as well. So you can find data for your um, community and be able to use that as a tool to advocate with your members of Congress about how critical it is to invest in nutrition programs because of the skyrocketing rates of food insecurity we're seeing now. Um, and it's just so important to remember that you can do um, so much to advocate for. Um, we know it works and it's investing in strong nutrition programs and our network is dedicated to making that clear now more than ever. Thank you. Thank you, Corey. Yes, and please drop that in the chat. Um, Chanya, how has the Bread for the World Network been, uh, been affected and, and how has that uh, changed what you're doing? So I, you know, you save the best for last. And so I will go with the human capital. I think most, um, we talked about the outreach in terms of the people we serve, but I will go with the outreach and how um, in my mind and my little sheet is not there, but I would say we focus on the human capital of our staff, uh, those that are in the field, those advocates uh, that are on the front line in our comms department. What we've seen is um, more of a marriage of those departments working together, create materials to get out in the field and training in a very different way. We're doing many more trainings doing, you know, over Zoom and things like that. And so for us, I think that would be one of the areas I will highlight. Everything that my colleagues have said today, we have worked in co uh, collaboration with them. We know that we have signed on to many, many letters. We have set on over, since I've been at Braid, at least over five dozens of calls advocating, talking to members of Congress about the, the, the importance of the 15% SNAP increase. We know that there was a win with the pandemic EBT and so we celebrate that. But for us, I would say one of the areas that we've been strong with because we do have a new administration or a new president and CEO, it has been looking at our human capital, how it is we're gonna be able to move forward with a new administration along with the set of circumstances we find ourselves in uh, as it relates to COVID, how are we gonna address that for the greater good of the people that we serve? I know that with the comms department, we're writing op-eds. We are doing more video conference testimonials, sending them up to member of Congress, getting that first person voice. So it's not Chanya who is not collected, uh, connected to that Senator or that Congressperson, but it is directly a constituent. And so we're also bridging the gap there as well. Some people have never used Zoom. We have all become experts at using Zoom and our capacities these days, but everyday people are not, they like Zoom what? Zoom, Zoom, Zoom. They think I'm talking about a vehicle, but, and so we are now bridging that gap, showing them how it is that they can still be great advocates. They can still be on the front lines advocating for the issues that are important to them. And so we're keeping the main thing, the main thing, focusing on anti-hunger programs and um, addressing them by making sure they have what they need and they are really, really equipped. But I'm super excited about our organizers and our comm teams who have just found this great marriage of saying, okay, let's, let's get this together. You know what, let's talk with GR, but this is what we know they need to hear from. Um, and so during that last week, right before the election, our comms department was on the phone with ARG, like, we need stories, we need voices, we need to send them everyday people. And so I think the human capital side of it, because we're not a direct service organization, we're working with the people to make sure that their voices are heard on the Hill. And so we continue to push that forward and ensuring that we get the next increase, the SNAP 15% uh, increase in addition to COVID relief, because we realize families can't wait. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I actually would like to pick up on a theme that you were mentioning uh, in terms of how has your advocacy changed? You talked about op-eds, you talked about um, Zoom calls with members of Congress. Maybe you can dig into uh, that a little bit more as well. Certainly, you know, I, I come from Capitol Hill. So every day you had a coffee. Every day you had a reception and every day you, not every day you had a gala, but those were when the, those were the opportunities where you had time to kind of press the flesh and talk to somebody, give them a nice hug. And they knew that you were very sincere about the issue. Now this whole Zoom, you know, you don't know if they're going to get it because you don't know if it's going to go to spam box or where, but what I did in my personal 
my personal space. I went to my LinkedIn and I resent, hey, I'm not on the hill anymore. I'm at Bread for the World. This is what we're advocating for. I hope your boss will support the SNAP 15% increase. I even went into their Facebook uh, in Messenger and say, hey, I've been trying to say, schedule a meeting. So we, we do have to do things a little bit different, thinking outside of the box. One of the other things that I um, talked about is that we are now in our database, we send direct op-eds directly relating to hunger issues directly to members of Congress, stories that we get on the ground. So members of Congress who are already our champions can uh, amplify those voices and make sure that their colleagues understand that these are the issues that real people are dealing with. This is not anything that's fabricated and made up, but these are real stories because they don't get to see them out on the front lawn or the Capitol or in the buildings at the doors, but here are real stories. And so we continue to give them uh, sample information about tell your story, tell your story, talk about how it impacts you, um, make that phone call, post on their web, their uh, social media and let them know what's going on with you. Um, you know, and at the end of the day, we're in a lobby world or advocacy world. It is all about relationships. And so I can't underscore that enough. And so for me, it is sort of this, um, this uh, new dance that I have to do. It's more of a social media dance. It's more of a Zoom dance. Hey, let's meet. And I'm still doing coffees and teas at my computer now. I can't be in the bottom of Longwood or Rayburn, but now I'm reaching out to them saying, hey, I really want your member to understand the importance of this. And so I'm sending along the information. But it's a lot of different ways I know many of us are doing um, to continue to make sure that we are getting those op-eds and all of those other things in front of them. Wonderful, thank you. Um, do any of the other panelists want to weigh in on how has your advocacy approach changed? And in particular, any tips for you have for our viewers who may not already be plugged in to uh, you know, some, some advocacy mechanism? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to chime in. Um, with that, as I mentioned, with that great increase of wonderful partners in so many different states um, and districts, that instantaneously uh, said to me and our government affairs team, wow, that is a meeting with a member of Congress or a senator that we have to take. Now, with 40 states, we're thinking about over 80 senators, and we, we're setting out plans on how to be much more aggressive in 2021 and engagement. Um, but recognizing that you know, the important work that we all do in our network here in DC as part of the Alliance in Hunger and so many other uh, coalitions that include Mills and Wills and uh, Breath, for, Breath for the World and Islamic Relief, but ultimately it's not us, the in the beltway advocates that are gonna really make that difference as China just really yeah. so eloquently put forth, but providing the resources, the support of one, at least at the grass tops, the executive directors, the advocates of local based organizations who may be known by known entities by members of Congress and their senators for the good, wonderful humanitarian work, but they've never been perceived as an advocacy and lobbying uh, machine or organizing means in their district. And I've seen that, and I think many of us in some of our calls in the past few weeks, we've recognized that actually members of Congress uh, with so many Zooms, I've never had in collaboration with so many of these partner organizations, never had so much um, access to actual members coming onto these Zoom calls. It's a whole different effect when I'm just sending a request to meet with a, a staffer, a legislative assistant, compared to when I say I'm going to be joined by four or five executive directors from actual organizations in their districts. I've never had so many responses saying, let me follow up with you to see if we can get the member of Congress onto the call. And that changes the whole dynamic uh, in, in our ability to advocate and be more forceful and in what we stand for and what we're expecting from uh, our legislators in these districts when they're actually on the call, showing and appreciating the important work that these organizations are doing, but working with and prior to those meetings, training up, getting our talking points in line and really being very clear on what we expect and what we need for them to help their communities uh, that, that we're serving. Thank you, Jihad. Um, so I'm just gonna- you know, I, just, I just wanna build on what sure. everyone said with one particular piece, and that is that I think telling stories, frontline stories from people who are either beneficiaries, um, participants in these programs, who have been hardest hit by this pandemic, it's so important that mm -hmm. they have that opportunity. And so as much as we all, you know, lament Zoom, what Zoom has done is created greater access for people in more local communities to tell their stories. 
So I think that is one thing I'd like to really um, put forward is that being able to have someone, a partner on the ground, a, a school nutrition director hop on a phone instead of having to hop on a plane really has been an equalizer. So I just wanna highlight that one kind of more positive piece about Zoom, but I think giving access and allowing people to tell their story has been really incredibly powerful. Thank you, Monica. And why don't we uh, stay with you for the next question, which is, you know, you had mentioned earlier pandemic EBT and some of the other positive things that have come out of the, the Congress and this administration. Um, and maybe you can briefly explain what pandemic EBT is, just in case there are folks that are not as familiar. But what lessons can we learn from how Congress and the administration have handled the food security concerns so far during the pandemic? Yeah, I think it's really important for us to understand that hunger has been in existence even prior to the pandemic. And that currently we are seeing a staggering increase in hunger um, among all populations, the elderly, children, families, adults without children. It's across all boards. We're seeing this across all communities. So I think we have to understand that baseline. What the pandemic has done has really exacerbated hunger. Um, so all the gains we've made in trying to eliminate child hunger and hunger among other communities um, have been erased by this pandemic. Our administration, or I should say um, the USDA um, agency and Congress have only been prepared to respond to hunger and natural disasters. We have never had to respond to this type of a health crisis. So all of our response were really geared towards congregate feeding, you know, mass feeding by Red Cross and other providers. It was temporary. It was in a confined geographical area. That's not the case with this pandemic. It's, it's hitting everybody whether you live in the city, whether you live in a rural community, whether you live in a suburban community, it's impacted everybody. So I think what it has really done has really challenged um, the federal agencies as well as Congress and as well as us as program operators, providers, partners, um, the charitable food side to really think in an innovative way to be able to address the needs of every single community. And I just wanna point out that SNAP supplements food budgets. It does not cover everyone's food budget. It, is a, it averages out to $1.50 per meal, per person, per day. Think about that for a minute. It is not even enough to buy a cup of coffee um, if you're standing in line at Starbucks, um, maybe at Dunkin' Donuts, but maybe not quite, right? So let's, let's think about that for a minute. This is only to supplement what people are already putting in their food budget. The other piece of that is that, you know, it doesn't even last them the entire month. We already know that. We already know that people run out of SNAP benefits by the second week. And by then they're beginning to think about, um, you know, food banks. So, you know, this has really put an incredible amount of pressure. Um, but the other piece I wanna point out is SNAP is a stimulus to the economy. We know and USDA has confirmed that SNAP actually stimulates local economies and our national economy. Um, and it also helps the supply, food ch the supply chain um, as it relates to um, the food system. So, I mean, I think that for us, in terms of how we've had to respond, we've had to be nimble, we've had to be innovative, um, we've really had to work collaboratively. And, you know, a shout out to FNS, let's, let's give them credit where credit is due. And that is to be able to implement pandemic EBT, which provides a benefit for children who are unable to go pick up meals or because their parents are essential workers or frontline workers and they're not able to go to schools and pick up meals, pandemic EBT is helping to close that gap. And that is for children who are on free and reduced price meals. 
So to the extent that FNS was able to roll that out and get it up and running um, as quickly as they did, I think they deserve a little bit of credit for that. Um, and I think, you know, immediately responding to, you know, moving some of the nutrition waivers. Um, but again, it's an ongoing conversation between all of us as advocates, um, the agencies and Congress to best meet the needs of children um, as well as families. And the other piece is it costs us more money. It costs our economy, our country, and us more money when children are hungry, when people are hungry. So this is an investment in our future, and this is an investment in our economy going forward. Thank you, Monica. Does anyone else on the panel want to comment on what lessons we can learn from just what the response has been from the administration and the Congress so far? Um, and go ahead. Oh, this is Chanya. Go ahead, Chanya. Oh, that was a delay. I, I wanted to just add quickly. I yes, think, um, thank you, uh, Monica, for that. I do believe that um, some of the things that I wrote down because I had the question, so I wanna get my little answer out there so people can be thinking about this. But I think at each federal agency, they should create what we call accessibility task force. We know that there are many hard to count and hard to reach communities all across the US. And so you found, you saw as if it was, I, I, I don't know, I don't even know how, I don't have words for it. But looking at it, every federal agency, if there's a natural disaster or if a pandemic or something else happens, there needs to be, we need to be looking directly at who's not going to really have access to this because they don't have access to the internet. No, they don't have access to be able to get to a school because, yeah, you guys may have had the school lunch programs and the kids have to go pick it up. But if the parent has to work, you know, nine to five, who's going to pick it up? You know, accessibility is what the issue that we see many of our constituents facing around being able to have access to these programs. Then when we talked about the PPE products and things like that, we had small businesses that still weren't able to have access to that. So I would argue that, or I would state that federal agencies should have accessibility task force that would deploy as soon as something happened and say, we need to make sure this community get it. We know the middle class, the upper class, and everybody else is going to get what they need to get, but we need to be keenly focused on the ones who are going to be disproportionately impacted. Even with disseminating tests in different communities right now for COVID. Someone should be looking at the accessibility of that. If I have to go all the way up to Walgreens and this and that, like I may, not, there might not even be a Walgreen in my neighborhood or, you know, things like that. So I think it needs to be a better uh, collaboration among the federal government with local um, organizations, particularly, you know, we're talking about food, food banks and other community-based organizations. And, and I know that it can be done. It just has to be the will of Congress and or those federal agencies who are in position, which are supposed to be there to help everyday people get it what they need when they are in need. So that's my answer for that. Thank you. Thank you, Chanya. I appreciate that. And as a matter of fact, um, I'd like to dig a little bit more into the points you were making in terms of what policies and practices should we be putting into place now, now that we have this experience and we have, you know, uh, sort of a sense of what would help us be more food secure and resilient in the future. Um, Jihad, any suggestions or any of the other panelists? Oh, uh, there's been so many wonderful points already so cogently put forward, both by Monica and Chania, but just, I mean, to really uh, put it out there, particularly on SNAP, and this has been a strong focus of the advocacy network here in DC and nationwide for the past 10 months. But clearly, SNAP has been, is the most efficient means of responding to hunger in our country. And unfortunately, we've seen prior to uh, the pandemic, we saw there were actually attempts to weaken its ability uh, for its effectiveness through administrative rule change. But overall, we, what we do need is, and as Monica said, if you think about what is, when it comes to the average meal allocation of a SNAP benefit, of being somewhere just by around $1.40 or so. Again, no one's living high off the hog off SNAP. These notions that people buying prime rib and lobster for dinner, no, don't fall for the okie doke people. You know, this is not true. Again, it is a supplemental means. So when we're asking for you, I mean, all of the great folks who are joined on to this, if this has not been part of your work, implementing programs and response to needs is important, but advocacy has to be seen as fundamental to your mission. And right now, the most important thing that we can be advocating for is strengthening that SNAP program. Um, 
increasing it, the SNAP benefit by 15%. Again, that could raise up to about $1.55 to $1.60. And also, there is, for many people, a minimum of SNAP right now that is only at $16. Raising the minimum SNAP benefit, monthly benefit, to, again, just to $30. It could be a, a increase and very important change. And, and also then rolling back again and looking at some of these administrative rule changes that could limit the ability of, of families and individuals to uh, benefit from uh, SNAP programs in time of pandemic and such as this. Now, I also want to, you know, Monica raised some good points. 2021 for our, our advocacy network was also, we were looking to be a year for a child nutrition reauthorization potentially and thinking about some of these, again, these needs, how, the, the, the game has been changed from the notion of congregate feeding and emergency response, and looking at programs, pilot projects and programs such as summer EBT, and then how that's also been reflected now in pandemic EBT. How do we strengthen these programs, taking them from pilot projects into strengthening programs in child nutrition reauthorization, CNR, uh, potentially is important. And speaking about China, and again, thinking about those communities that we have to focus on, Native American communities rural populations. And this is very much a lot of the summer EBT was addressing the hope for was for this next iteration of child nutrition, nutrition reauthorization was to strengthen ex access. We've made strong gains in past years and iterations on nutritional value and so forth, but now is actually strengthening access. Communities in food. You know, yes, we can increase EBT. We can increase the, the value of the, the SNAP benefit. But what if you're living in a food desert right now? in a community where you don't have access to fresh produce. You know, unfortunately, quite often people may be using their EBT at places maybe like the Dollar General that may not have a produce section. And so again, how do we strengthen these programs of not just access, but also access to nutritional, uh, high nutritional uh, foods, not just the fillers, you know, the, the carbs and so forth. So, and then I would just last say, it is again, it's important for organizations that implementing and including advocacy into your work. Again, many organizations may not have a designated staff member or a volunteer who's an advocate, but thinking about how can you bring your organization, your local community organization, your faith-based organization, your, your food pantry, in collaboration with a local or state or regional-based hunger-free community um, advocacy coalition, working with these organizations that could do a lot of the legwork Again, of organizing the meeting, setting the meeting up, making it all possible for you in coalition with other faith-based organizations and social justice organizations being a strong voice in your local communities. And I would, last I would say that for many of us, I would have no problem if people were thinking about calling me directly or to Islamically saying, we want to do more. We want to meet with our center. We've never done it before. Can you do it for us? Hey, that's what I get paid to do and I'll be happy to do that. So, <laughs> so how to utilize Red for the World? how to utilize Mills for Wills in their local offices or chapters. You know, not always looking at your peer organizations, they're maybe small and sometimes understaffed, but think about the national organizations and how we want, we want to work more with you in, in advocacy. And so make us do our job. <laughs> Thank you, Jihad. In our last two minutes, I do wanna address some audience questions and get uh, Katie and Corey uh, back in the conversation. So I'll start with you, Corey. There's an audience question. Um, how do you see this pandemic being an opportunity to fix the food system? Thank you. Um, I, I think I just wanna underscore again that um, in the legislation that we have seen in the CARES Act and the Families First, we have seen what strong policy that puts families in need at the center of the legislation can do to support people. Um, we know what's effective and it's investing in, in federal nutrition programs. And I hope that coming away from this, no one will ever question again, the efficacy and efficiency of SNAP and other programs like SNAP. Um, it's, it's important to remember that these programs are essential and critical um, when people are in need. And um, I hope that we come away from this feeling that sentiment stronger. Thank you, Corey, appreciate that. And uh, Katie, um, what are your thoughts on the prospect of a Biden-Harris administration in terms of our advocacy priorities? Yeah, it's interesting. I think it's, it brings back everything that, the, that we've all been saying today is that we have a long way to go, um, even before COVID, but now following COVID to allow communities to be more secure, resilient, 
to really understand the causes of hunger and the intersections of hunger and how it impacts different parts of the countries and communities and even individuals, families differently. So how to take these lessons that we've learned from COVID um, through this process that we've all been going through, the ways we've become more nimble, the new partnerships we've made and, and move them forward. And so I think a new administration always brings possibilities of new conversations and new policy, um, but some of those same roadblocks still remain. So it just an encouragement for all of us not to become complacent and to say that this is a journey we need to continue to move forward on and to take the lessons we're continuing to learn um, into this new year, into the new administration. Thank you, Katie. That's a wonderful place to end. And I'd like to thank you and all of our panelists and just acknowledge all of you for how collaborative you've been. Um, thank you to everyone who's joined us today. And uh, we will be next. Uh, you have a little bit of a break before our 430 session where we will be uh, meeting one another and networking and listening to some wonderful poetry to wrap up the day. Uh, so again, thank you to all of our panelists and we'll see you at 430. Minerva, I just want to thank you and the Alliance in Hunger. I know on behalf of all our organizations, the, the wonderful work you always do, but particularly over this pandemic and bring us all together. And, and no doubt the, the best practices and the, much, the great information that I share at our local partners is definitely been reflected in the, the resources that we've received through our collaborations through the Alliance in Hunger. So thank you so much. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all of our panelists today. Enjoy this short break and our next session, as Minerva said, is our social networking session. So we hope to see you there. Thank you.